heart and head to praise Allah till I drop dead. Blessings on the prophet and respect the sorrows if she had. Start again, start again. I, I might get bored in the middle of it. It shouldn't sound like a chore. It should not be a chore. Okay? We cannot do this unless you are committed to this. Okay? Everybody said this is what you want. I want to learn my dean. I want to learn. I want it to be in a way it's easier for me to learn. I'm not that good in Arabic. I can read it, but it's like, well, here it is. What, what more can you ask for? I'm needing you now to commit. Give some more spirit. Don't just, okay, I'm doing this. No, do it with, with your heart and head. Again, Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I gave my word with heart and head to praise Allah till I drop dead. Send blessings on the prophet and respect the scholars each to have. As Muslims, we must study and pray to fight shaitan in every way and expect mistakes along the way I gave my word with heart and head. Let's hear that. I gave my word with heart and head. To do what? To praise Allah till I drop dead. And say it like you mean it. To praise Allah till I drop dead. Let's go. I gave my word. I gave my word with heart and head. To praise Allah till I drop dead. Send blessings on the prophet and respect the scholars if you have. Let's go. To praise Allah till I drop dead. Send blessings on the prophet and respect the scholars if you have. It's not ishtihad. You can hear it's not ishtihad. Ishtihad. Come on, do it again. From the beginning. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I gave my word with heart and head. We praise Allah till I drop dead. This blessings is on the proper end. Respect the scholars ishtihad. And as Muslims, we must study and pray. We must study and pray. We say it, be there for the words there. We must study and pray. Look at the struggle we're going through. I gave my word with heart and head. This is your own testimony. Your own reminder. Please. I gave my word with heart and head to praise Allah till I drop dead. Send blessings on the prophet and and then think of all the times where the scholars have been disrespected and we didn't want it that way. Respect the scholars each the head. As Muslims or all Muslims, as Muslims, we must study and pray. This is our resolve, right? We're reminding ourselves. We're giving our mission statement. As Muslims, we must study and pray. Why? Because it's difficult, right? It's difficult for us to find time, energy, right? To physical, mental energy, to study and apply and we can't we keep praying for that tawfiq. That's what we're praying for, right? We're explaining, acknowledging our weakness and begging for guidance in tawfiq. Tawfiq does not mean success. Everybody know that? So tawfiq is from the word wafaka. You wafiku. We say tawfiq and like wahada you wahidu tawheed. So wafaka means that your actions are in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to happen. Okay? What Allah commanded you to do. That's true success. So the meaning of it, calling it success, is only a byproduct of the understanding that our actions and our mindset are in line with what Allah commanded us and gave us the choice to do. Does everybody follow me? No. So that's what we want. We want to get that tawfiq. So again... I gave my word with heart and head to praise Allah to I drop in. Send blessings on the prophet and respect the scholars in your head. As Muslim means to fight shaitan again. Our reasoning is showing our intention. We study and pray. Why? To fight shaitan in every way. We have been drafted. Do we have the choice to fight shaitan? Yes. No. 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 
have to fight. You have to fight, Shaitan. You've been inscripted in Hezbollah, the army of Allah. That's what Allah says in the Quran. You're in the army of Allah. And He says, In the Shaitan al Adubun lakum. Fattakhiduhu Adubun. So Fattakhidu Adubun lakum means He is your enemy. He is clearly your enemy, meaning He is not, there is nothing else He's going to do. So this is a statement of fact. Does that make sense? We sometimes call this a, 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 a life rule. Could, could you find my daughter? I don't know where she's at. She's in the door coming. Yeah, I want to make sure. You know, I don't know who's coming in or anything like that. So he says, lakum, Meaning, Allah is saying that shaitan is your enemy to you, personally. <clears throat> so what does that mean? What does an enemy do? He spends every energy that he has in every moment. It's not a side job. It's not a hobby. It's his everything that he is doing. This is what sometimes we fail to realize. But even if we look at Islamic history or world history, we will note that the Kufar didn't take breaks from attacking the Muslims. These human shayateen, human devils, they would, we, the Muslims was worrying about who's going to be in charge and who's going to get married to this one and what we're going to do this time with this Eid and whose madhab is going to be. And the shayateen amongst the insane, the people are spending all their efforts to kill the Muslims, to destroy the Muslims. They're not taking a break in these efforts. It's, you get my point that this is the mentality. So we have to realize from the inswal jinn, the, the human devils and the, and the, the other types of devils, now, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. I finished my statement. You gonna call the other? No, no, no. Okay. They are making their efforts. Allah says, "Adubu lakum." So no matter what you do, fatahi duhu adubuan. So then you have to take him on as an enemy. It is part of your life mission from Allah that you spend your time. Fighting. So if you have to fight, then everything that you have to do to fulfill that rule becomes wajib upon you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. If you have to offer salah, what becomes wajib on you? Wudu. Right? Clean clothes, clean place. So if you have to fight shaitan, what do you have to do? Study and pray. Study, Study shaitan. Study what Allah wants you to understand, how shaitan has done these things. Because the Quran is a study of shaitan too. What shaitan has done all throughout the times with the different peoples and how they all fell victim to him and how those who succeeded, what they did to succeed. And so we have to study that and we have to pray because shaitan, we're told these are the rules. Shaitan's coming after you. And guess what? You might as well have a blindfold on because you can't see him. You get in the room and Allah says he sees you. Who uh, Him and all his tribe. From where you can't see them. So it's like getting in the ring with Mike Tyson after somebody really made him angry. After that divorce with that girl. Okay? Okay? And then you got a blindfold on. Now you say, hey, how am I going to win this fight? So that's what you have to study and pray. Because what is the weapon of the believer? Dua. Dua. How many major sins are there? Don't give me one word sentence. Give me a full sentence. There are 70 major sins. There are 70 major sins. We have organized them into seven body parts. The sins of the heart. Where are the other sins? No, no, the major sins from the tongue, the heart, the hands, stomach, private parts, the feet, and the whole body. Okay? And Allah gives us seven dua in the Quran that we can use to call on Him for protection in those places. And the Messenger of Allah gives us seven dua in the Sunnah. That we can use to call on Allah to help for help in those, those issues and seek his protection. That's only 14, right? Those are just major weapons that we can use. And there are more.
So the Muslim, as Muslim mean, we must say it like you mean it, like you understand it. You're reminding yourselves what our, what we are, our foundation is going to be. Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Go again. Okay, to fight shaitan in every way. In every way. What does it mean to be Hanifa? To incline what? Away from. Away from, not towards. Does it mean to be Hanifa, righteous, to incline to do good deeds? No. Away from evil. What's the ulama say? Why does it mean inclining away from evil deeds? Right? Away from shirk and kufr. Because the difference between a righteous person and an unrighteous person is not good deeds. Isn't that correct? Yes. Don't the thief give charity? Yes. Can a killer help an old lady across the street? Yes. So the only difference between the righteous and the unrighteous person is what they don't do. Does that make sense? And that is the unique meaning of Hanifa that we are climb away from certain activities. Anything that touches on shirk wa kuf. And this is the height of the meaning of wala wal bara. Does everybody follow me? Yeah. What we don't do. So as Muslimi will study and pray. Why? To fight shaitan in every way. And that's fighting shaitan in every way. That's fighting shaitan in our clothing, in our speaking, in our walking, in our eating, in our sleeping, in our using the, the facilities, in every way, our business, our marriages, the naming of our children. Every form of way that you can find, we incline away from the kafir, the kufr, and the shirk, and the mushrik. And we can only do that after studying and praying for the tawfiq from Allah, that we get that right. But... To fight shaitan in every way, what should we expect? Mistakes. Mistakes along the way. Expect mistakes along the way. One of the biggest problems is people not realizing that you will make mistakes every day. And then what happens? Sometimes the shaitan works on that for the person. He makes a mistake and they get depressed. He keeps saying, oh, look what you did. Look what you did. Oh, to make them think, oh, Allah will never forgive you. Or you don't deserve the tawfiq from Allah. Right? This is what they say. So then if you don't feel you deserve it, then you don't seek for it. But we see that majorly amongst our people not looking for success because they have been taught they don't deserve it. So they don't even strive for it. They accept that I'm a nigga. <coughs> don't we hear people saying this? Yeah. This is as far as I can go. And you're not going to call yourself a liar. If that's where you're shooting for, then that's where you're going to get. And if you're not going any higher, then you will never go any higher because you'll refuse to go any higher. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us how great and how high Ahsan al taqweem the human can be. And then we know that he's fallen only from following shaitan. Does that make sense? So as Muslimin, we'll do what? Then I want you to say it like you really mean it Because if there's no commitment No spiritual commitment it don't. What do we say? We see guy on the stage do a play Or do some type of anything Do any type of presentation And we say he has no heart He did it without any heart We say it's lifeless, right? Lifeless. Well that's what you're kidding ourselves like to me No, I'm serious We, you know, We've been here for a couple of months now You know, I'm be honest with you guys it's, I got to hear that you, you know, you can hear when people are committed into it. It should not be a chore. It should be a joy. Right? We got it. We're going through this now. Let's hear it again from the beginning. Bismillah. Bismillah. <laughs> 
How do we get out of that? How do we get out of that mistake? Because mistakes are depressing sometimes, right? We are sad. The Prophet Sallallahu said that Iman is between what? Fear and hope, right? Iman is when you are happy about your good deeds and saddened by your bad deeds, right? No. So this is good that you would get sad by your bad deeds. And we can see this in body language and everything. Everybody know the psychology of, of gravity doubling when someone is depressed? That's why they call it depressed. Someone depressed that can't hold their head up, right? It's so hard for them to make that movement because the, the weight has doubled on them. And so we practice good posture and everything like that. We say gravity, uh, what do you call it, defying efforts. Children see somebody, hey, they defy gravity, right? They stand up. People sitting down, they, oh, defying gravity when they're happy. And when they're sad, it pushes down. How do we stop? How does a person who's guilty stop from being guilty? Okay? When does he stop being a criminal and he becomes someone who has did something bad? What's the step he has to take? Repentance. Repentance. That's the difference. Because if he hasn't, hasn't repented, he's still in the state of his crime. Right? Yeah. Or his mistake. And repent and then expect forgiveness, right? Expect forgiveness. Then this becomes, this, this is a good question. Should we expect forgiveness? Yes, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Kareem. He is Ghafoor Rahim, a Tawab, right? He has all these names that show that he is the most generous. It's like this, Allah is saying to us, look, the ulama say, it's imagine you have a billionaire who's giving out hundred dollar bills, okay? He's known for his Jawab al Kareem, his generosity. And you come over and ask him for 10 cents. You think he's not going to give you that? Or more than that? Not only that, Allah has told you. Ya ibadi, oh my slave. If your sins were to be reached the heavens, was like the, the, the froth on the ocean. And you would have come to me, not making any shit with me, asking forgiveness, I'd give you forgiveness, all of that. If it were to reach the height of the sky, I would give you forgiveness of all of that. Sadaq Allah. You get my point? Also, when we say in the Quran, La Allakum, when Allah says perhaps that you would, we say that it's going, you should expect it. The believer has to be positive. What is it? Optimistic, I think the term is, right? Optimistic. To be pessimistic is part of kufr. And optimism is from Islam. Does that make sense? To us, the fly is always trying to get out the house. <laughs> Open the window, let them out. <laughs> so this is our mentality. Start from the beginning, please. Recite it this loud. I gave my word for heart and to praise the Lord to our God here. Since where is the Lord and prophet in, respect the scholars each they have. As Muslims, we must study and pray to fight shaitan in every way. Expect the space along the way. Day. It's very important that we expect mistakes along the way. It's very important that we understand that we have to repent to fight another day. Once we realize that we will make mistakes, we just get up, right? You fall down, you get up. You maybe not even wipe yourself off and just keep on going. It's no big deal, okay? Just keep them going. We're not the first ones on the planet. Humping, hopefully we won't be the last ones, okay? Because the last day will only be on the worst of the people. And may Allah not make us amongst us. Amen. Amen. So this is our hope that we study and pray. And this is our foundation. And we hope that we fight shaitan in every way that we can possibly do so. Yes, sir. In what ways we're making repentance would be maybe more so that Allah will accept it? What, what conditions? Alhamdulillah, these are the, 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 the poem is going to get to that. Okay. Right here, we, everything we mentioned here. In the introduction, it's just the introduction. We go on to the next page now. And the next page goes on to talk about as Muslim, as, as Muslim, I'm sorry. So the first thing that I have to do, let's go again. So the first thing that I have to do, now that I'm, and I mentioned mentioned before, and I didn't mention the I am yet, 
La yukallifu Allah nafsan illa wus'aha. This as is the ayah. And every verse or in this poem has a Quranic or ayah that, that, that supports it, or many, many ayah that support it. Okay? It's not a rhyme like a hip hop, a hibbity hip hop. This is everything is here is didactic for educational purposes. So the first thing that I have to do now that I'm accountable, accountable in my actions call on. Now the poem is just giving you the definition of mukallafun, which is accountable in every way my actions call on. And we mentioned before that even if you were born in Kafir, in a Kafir country with Kafir parents and cousins and aunts and uncles, once you become mukallaf, you are responsible for your future. You are responsible for your iman. Allah does not say, oh, because this Kafir was born in a Kafir environment, and they say, oh, he's going to, no, no break is given to him. And some of the ulama of Egypt said how we are, you know, really scary people because here it is, we found Islam, right? And for the most part, most of our ancestors that we know of in the United States were not Muslim or were not allowed to express Islam if they even knew about it. If they, we can say we understand people who knew words because sometimes we find words in our like natural course of talk that we find, oh man, these words go back to Africa, right? Like Nana. We didn't know that was an African word. We just thought it meant grandma. It do. In Africa, but we didn't know that. We just knew that was for grandma. So there are things within our culture that we have picked up, but we didn't know it was Islam, but somehow we got to Islam by the tawfiq and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? right? So we are proof of the fact that just because you were born in a Kafir environment, under Kafir parents, that you can get out of and can become a Muslim. And Allah doesn't give those Kafirs a break. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, every, why? Because he, he designed us, qaddarana, and he gave us the understanding of Iman. And so we can recognize it through what we see. And anyone who conceals that is called a what? Yeah. Kafara. And that's what we call a farmer who conceals the seed. That's where the word comes from. Okay, so the first thing that I have to do now that I'm, this is an acknowledgement of my accountability and responsibility. Now that I'm mukallafun, accountable in my actions call on, use your hands to talk to yourself so that you can remember it. My actions call on is look to see what have I complied with? What do I think about why it's correct? And this is the same thing we find Hafiz al Hakami. He said in his book, Sulla Musul. I'm always quoting from Sulla Musul because where I got the idea to make this type of poem and also from Al Akhbari. He says, Awwulu wajibun ala al Abid ma'arifatu al Rahman bit tawheed. The first obligation of the Abid of the, is to get to know Rahman with tawheed. This is always our first obligation. Okay? So, after saying this part, we say, the meaning of shahada is the first thing we must know. There is no God. For real, that is. Now, you can open up your books. Come now, come now. The meaning of shahada is the first thing we must know. Say it. The meaning of shahada is the first thing we must know. There is no God. For real, that is, except the one and only. There Say that again. There is no God for real that is except the one and only. We say for real that is because there are things that people take as gods. Allah tells us in the Quran, well, have you not seen the one who's taken his hawa as his God, his desires? That's the most thing people... This is the most thing that I think people take as shirk. Their own selves. Their own desires. And this is mentioned in the beginning of the Quran when he starts talking about the Munafiq. He already has a preconceived idea of what he wants things to be. And when they don't show up that way, he hates it silently. And now he only wants to look at those ayat that are ambiguous so that it would play into what he wants it to mean. And when you bring proofs that show it out, he starts to hate you. Right? And this is the beginning of his nifaq and it grows until it's all the way into kufr based on someone wanting to follow their desires. Does that make sense? No. 
So the meaning of Shahada is the first thing we must know. Say it. The meaning of Shahada is the first thing we must know. There is no God, for real that is, except the one and only. Okay, so most people say, oh, I want to learn about Aqidah, right? We hear this. We've heard this a lot of times. But if you ask them about this, the basic Shahada, they don't know it. They don't understand it. We say it means la ashadu an la ilaha illallah, right? Illallah. And it's ilaha, la ilaha. Say it. La ilaha. Why does it have a fatha on ilah? Isn't it supposed to be tanween? It's la. The la here is more different, it's most totally different. In Arabic, you have un, an, in. Don't we know that? But well, where is it here? And why, what made this a fatha? That's the first thing you need to know in Tawheed. That the fatha there is a negation of every type, shape, form, or fashion. Like mama used to say, no way, shape, form, or fashion, right? Just like we say, we see this a lot, we just don't pay attention to it. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا See that? لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّتَ you guys, so we see this, but a lot of people haven't taught, understood what it means. That fatha, in place of a dhamma, the matan, is to show you that this is a nephew, is a negation of all types. All types. No small God, no big God, no little God, no take fake God. No type of God exists. No type, and what is a God? An object of worship. There is no true, real object that deserves to be worshipped, that has the right to be called a deity, a God, a Lord, in all the descriptions that Allah gives except Allah, which points to that this is his name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that make sense? So we translate this as there is no God for real, that is except the one and only. Al Ahad, a Soman. And this is the description of saying, Who is Allah? Al Qulhu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Soman. Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad. And Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad is, is a description of a Soman. If you wonder, well, what is a Soman? Lam Yalid. Alladhi Lam Yalid. Alladhi Lam Yulad. Wa Lam Yakun Lahu Kufu Anahad. The one who wasn't born and didn't give birth to nobody. And there is nothing that can take his place in any shape, form, or fashion. That's what a summat is. It's the one that everything ultimately goes back to. A summat. And Ahad is the one and only. So this is what La ilaha illallah means. And we say there is no God. For real that is. Because we're not negating that people take on fake gods. And worship things that don't realize they're being worshipped. This is the height of riyah. Riyah doesn't mean you show it off. It's from the word ra'a. Ara alam tara. Don't you see? It's called ra'a, riyah. Riyah means I see you. And so because I see you, I show up. You don't necessarily see me or notice me. You may be ignorant that I'm there. But because I see you, I act up. Does that make sense? And they call it the silent or the, the most hidden type of shirk. But there is a cure. Everything has a cure. Right, it's like a black, it's a dark night with a black ant on a black rock. Right? Can you see that? No. So how do you escape it? Because you start feeling desperate. Well, then we all gonna fall into it, right? Wrong. There's always a way to get around that stuff. There's always a technique. What's the technique? Seek refuge with Allah. Seek refuge with Allah. True. Everything deals with seeking refuge in Allah. Allah told us a dua. Allah, Allah, Rabbi, la ushriku bihi shay'a. Allah. Allah, Rabbi. So you're saying Allah twice. Allahu, Allahu Rabbi. Allahu, Allahu Rabbi. You're acknowledging, this is Taqi. Allah, Allah, meaning only Allah, is my Lord. La ushriku bihi shay'an. 
So you're, you're acknowledging. You get the point? Now, what does that do for you? You still, somebody might still show up. No. You want to show off. All you got to remember is stop showing off to people. Who cares about people? Who should you show off to? You know the angels are there, right? You can show off to the angels and not get in trouble. You get my point? Seriously. You want to show off? Say, well, watch this angel. You know, Allah sees it, right? Allah sees. And he says that he tells us that Ihsan is like you see Allah, not see the people. Imagine now that you can see Allah, right? Because isn't that what Riyah is? You see the people, so you act up. So imagine, because you can't see him, but imagine that you see that Allah is watching you, that he's right watching you. But even though you can't even imagine that because you can never see nothing you've ever seen, never seen before. You know that he sees you. Right? You know this is so now you act, you stand especially tall because you know Allah is there. You know what not there, but Allah is watching you and he has knowledge of what you're doing at all times. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's who you show off to. Fadl Yashir. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول حيا على الصلاة لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله حيا على الصلاة لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله حيا على الفلاح لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله حيا على الفلاح لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الله لا إله إلا الله. Okay, why do we say لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله when he says حي على الصلاة and حي على الفلاة? Other times in the in the Adhan we're told to repeat what the what what the Muaddin says, right? But at two places we're told to say لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله, which means there is no help and no no strength except with Allah, right? Except by Allah, which means we can't do that without your help, right? No. So why do we say it at those places? You can't come to success. You can't come to salah without the help of Allah, right? And you can't come to success without the, the, the tawfiq from Allah. And this is what we say, alhamdulillah, the timma to salihat, right? We say, alhamdulillah, all praise belongs to Allah. The one who completes and makes us get to the fruition, the fruition of any good righteous deed. You get my point? It's all alhamdulillah. And that's why we use alhamdulillah when we mention to praise Allah till we drop that because Allah begins his book with alhamdulillah. Feel bidayah in the beginning and then here and after. Wa akhiri da'wala and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, right? Alhamdulillah fi sama'i wal ard. Alhamdulillah in the sky and in the, in the earth, right? Wa akhiri. And so we always have this alhamdulillah because he is the one that allows us to do it. And so again, iyaka na'abudu. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we're at La ilaha illallah. It points to Tawheed and away from Shirk. And there are seven keys to it, right? So the meaning of Shahada is the first thing we must know. There is no God for real, that is, except the one and only. People want to talk about Aqidah and want to explain things far related, but we want to explain the simple things first. It's like anything. You go and you do the basics. You become firm in the basics and everything else is, is built on time, that foundation. Okay? There is no God for real that is except the one and only. Why? The Khalqu, he created it. And for them, he provides. He, provides. he manages affairs of theirs from? And this is all in the Quran. Allah is the Lord, right? The creator. He's the shaper and the one that made you, right? This is what he is. Bari al bala Okay? Munshi al khala'i. 
Mithal and Sabiq. This is what he is. The Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the poem I'm reading, is another poem, but this is what we say about our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, Mudabbiru al-amri minas sama'i ila al-ard. And he manages affairs of theirs from high above the sky. And Allah says it in the Quran, Yudabbiru al-amr, he manages the affairs, minas sama'i, from the sky to the earth. Does that make sense? So this poem is just expressing to us what we should know about La ilaha illa, why he is doing it, and no one else does that, okay? Where, 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 where was I at? Give me the poem. Too high, too high, I say sublime, I can see. Too high is ta'ala. That's all it is, ta'ala. That's how we say that in Arabic. Ta'ala. Sublime is what? Subhana. So what he's saying, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all he's saying. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he's giving you a, 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 what it means. Too high, meaning Allah is too lofty, too high for it to be having any type of mistakes in it. Sublime is he, perfect. And glorious is he. Too high, I say sublime is he for? Partners on the beard. He's too high to have a partner. He don't need no partner. And there's no nadir. A nadir here is what? A competition. There's no competitors. No rivals. No, ri no ri competitor, rival. Ain't nobody challenging him for the title. Shaytan has permission. He's been given an allowance that he asked for. Right? And he was given a charter. You go ahead and do that and see what happens. Right? And he's been told what he can do and what he can't do. So he has perimeters that he has to work through. Nadir. Nadir. No. And we know the perimeters. That he yeah, we know his perimeters. The thing about it, Allah tells us, And Allah says, I'm testing you. I have no doubt who's doing this. I'm doing this. So we don't got to blame Shaitan. Okay? And Shaitan gets arrogant when we blame him. One time a horse stumbled, and the Prophet and one of the companions said, Ta'is a Shaitan. A stinking Shaitan. And Allah Messiah said, Yeah, don't say that. As soon as you do that, the Shaitan think he's doing something. Wait, it's not. He think he's doing, he think he got something going on. But say, Bismillah. Remember Allah. Because Bismillah, with the, with the permission of Allah, with the utilization of Allah, so the name of Allah. When, when that happens, shaitan gets small like a gnat, decreases, and it's humiliated that even in anything we remember Allah, not him. He wants the dhikr. We're only going to remember him as shaitan in rajim. Does that make sense? So, too high I say sublime is he for? Partners, Partners and nadir, competitors, rivals. And this is what shahada means, basically. And this is it. And this is what shahada means. But let us make it clear. There are conditions tied to it that we to which we must adhere. <coughs> Knowledge then yaqeen and then 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 nasid ikhlasu and Allah we ask for help and to administ into gender. We say Allah we ask for help. This is we put this here, this taqdeem here, by putting Allah first. Then we, we make hasr. We don't allow anything else to come in there. Allah, we ask for help. Does that make sense? Yeah. Nobody else. Allah, we ask for help and oh, to admit us into Jannah. We're not oh, asking so and so and so and so. And this is coming from what we learned from Ibrahim. When Ibrahim was thrown into the fire, Hespi Allah wa ni'ma wa kill. Sufficient for me is Allah. Allah, we ask for help. And so Jibreel comes, you want something? I don't need nothing from you. This is what Ibrahim told Jibreel. I don't know from you. You mean Arabic we say Allah nas'al. Allah nas'al. Yeah, Allah we ask. By putting it first. Does that make sense? It restricts no. from the advent of, or action or adding anyone else in there. He said, but from Allah, yes. And so Allah, baradan wa salaman to Ibrahim. Made it cool and peaceful for him. Sir. Is there a narration that uh, Ibrahim as the last thing? Similar, same type of thing. You know, the language is going to be the same, same, 
think. If, you know, from you, I don't want anything, but it's from Allah, yes. Yes, sir. Um, I learned uh, watching a video on YouTube about Hafi Allah. And um, when Ibrahim said to Hafi Allah, he's affirming that he is Allah, so he doesn't need no one else on his side. He doesn't even have to worry about it. And That's the, right. And, the, and he commanded the fire who keep him cool. Kafa billahi hasiba. And Allah is sufficient, you know, enough as a hasib, the one to take care. And we call this hasib, it's like having an attorney, if we want to put it in sight. Or like Americans, like you got an attorney that's going to take care of everything. You ain't got to worry about it. Does that make sense? No. And I'm not saying the law is like that and, and making them feel or anything. I'm trying to get an understanding on, on the concept. Okay? Yes, ma'am. The meaning of inqiyadu. In inqiyadu is to be driven. You in, become a steering wheel. Inqiyadu. And inqiyadu. Inqiyadu is to allow yourself to be turned and directed and not refusing. See, it's, it's showing all forms and angles of, re of rebellion and resistance. <laughs> so so we say like this. The first thing we say is knowledge. Then yaqeen. Knowledge, right? First you get knowledge. Then yaqeen. Then you're really certain. That means that, that knowledge is six degrees, right? You have, you have you know, jahl basit and jahl murakkab. Then al al wahm, right? Then shak, and then you have dhan, and then you have ilm al yaqeen. See, now you're certain. Now you have yaqeen. You're certain. Ilm al wal yaqeen. What comes next? In qiyad. Now after you have no kubul, right? Then you allow you accept the situation as it is. When you accept it, now you're easy going, right? You you stop all reasons, and now you can accept in qiyad. And allow yourself, Allah says this, Allah says that. And we see this in the story of Musa. When Allah told him to do something, he did it. Whatever it was. When Musa came and he said, yo, you see them coming? And he says, yo, kalla. I'm with my Lord. Say, Hadini. He's going to guide me. I don't know what's going to happen next, basically. But I trust and know that he told me to come here. It's going to go down good. And Musa didn't know what's going to happen when he took that stick and hit the water. Didn't know. But he did it. And whatever happened, happened. That's in Qiyah. Does that make sense? No, no. And we have that with many of the prophets as well. Luke, when he told to leave, he left. Don't look back. Whatever that means, I'm not going to look back. So this is in Qiyah. We accept it. Some people say, Allah says, Wastaghfirullah. Make a stick for me. Well, how is it going to help me out, brother? <laughs> Yo, Allah send down rain at night. You know? He do all types of good things for you. Now, and when they see the different, when the different groups seeing each other, the point is, and I, I want to get through this today. But the point is, is to accept yourself to be driven and not to resist. You know, and ask for why and how come, and, and you know, this and this. It'll come with knowledge. Then they're sick. You be honest and give a full with the intiyad. You do it the best way you can. Then that leads to ikhlas. You know, that's whole. You you got no room for anything else. Okay, which helps you incline away from shirk and all that stuff. You start to despise it. And, and the ulama used to say that your iman leads through your eyes. The Prophet said, Man yara minkum al munkarifa, yugayiru biyadi. Change it with his hand. Then, bilisan. And if he can't, then he should speak out against it. Because it's going to cause him heart. Then he should hate it in his heart. You see, wholeheartedness for Allah. No room for something else. So if I have my love and my class for Allah, then I don't have room for nothing else. Someone else's system. Someone else's ideas outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا يوفق الله بذلك It's not in, in line with what Allah has taught me. And so I have to hate that thing. And if I don't, ذلك أضعف الإيمان That's the weakest of Iman. Meaning that if you don't even hate it in your heart, then you have no Iman. Does that make sense? And so one of the times the Sheikh said, he made the example of a lady walking down the street. And the men say, ooh la la. She's just like a, a you know what? Right? A female devil. And the man says, oh man, ooh. And he doesn't hate it. His iman has left through his eyes. Does that make sense? No. He should do what the prophet told him. When he sees her, attraction does not mean you like it. See, I'm waving my hand. You're attracted to see it. Don't mean you like it. Does that make sense? No. And just because she drew your attraction of your eye, once you see what it is, what are you told to do? Lower your gaze. Right? You just assessed it to see if it was a danger. Right? You saw what it was, and now if this, this lady is naked, you should, Allah's message said, go home. Yeah. Go home. Because your wife has better than that. 
and you just witnessed it and you should verify and acknowledge that you just saw a female devil. And if you don't believe that, you, you disbelieved in the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he said you just saw a female devil. So your reality has to be that. That's that ikhlas. Which is the height. The height of our iman. Allah, we ask for help. And to admit us into Jannah. Then every Muslim must confer. Muhammad is? Yes. Must concur. Then every Muslim must concur. Because it's not alone. You know, a lot of times we talk about la ilaha illallah and we don't talk about Muhammad Rasulullah. People say la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. That's half the statement. Seriously, it's half. What about this part? Muhammad Rasulullah. Two words. Muhammad Rasulullah. Three if you want to say Muhammad Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. What does that mean? Now we say this one, it takes us away from shirk, right? And it takes us to what? Tawheed. Tawheed. What does this take us away from and guide us to? Oh, no, don't give me no English words. We gave you Arabic terms. This takes us away from what? Bid'ah. What is bid'ah? Because people say, oh, I don't want to hear about that. Bid'ah is the shirk of the second shahad. It's shirk. What do you mean it's shirk, Abu Chalba? Who are you supposed to follow? So that's what this is pointing to. Iktibah. Okay? I'm sorry. So iktibah is to follow the messenger of Allah, right? Now, if you follow someone else, you just make shirk. Does that make sense? And that's what bid'ah is. It's the shirk of the second shahad. To have your attachment to follow. Now, what does it now? The problem is we don't know what that means. What are you, what are you talking about? What are we supposed to understand when we say Muhammad or Rasulullah? Then every Muslim must concur. What does concur mean? Right, you have a concurring opinion or you have a dissenting opinion, right? I beg to differ. I disagree. And this is the dissenting opinion. But when you concur, you reaffirm. Aqarram, right? Have you concurred? Right? Have you said this is where you stand? This is aqrarna. We concur. Okay? So then what do we concur? Then every Muslim must concur. Meaning your shahada of the first part is not enough. It's not enough <coughs> without the second part. We have groups of people who say, I'm just going to follow the Quran. I'm not going to follow the Sunnah. That's, right, that's my choice. Yeah, I, it, it, it's the Quran. What you trying to say? Hey, but the Quran says, <laughs> So follow the Quran. Whatever the Prophet, whatever the Messenger gives you, then take it, right? But they don't get to read that part. They say that and they don't even read the Quran. It would be good if you started off that way because then it would lead you to the Qur'an, to the Hanif, to the Sunni. So it says that every Muslim must concur what? Six things. Muhammad is the messenger. Number one, that Muhammad is the actual. Muhammad ibn Abdullah is the actual, the actual physical messenger sent by Allah. Sent directly by Allah. That means he is the actual representative of Allah on earth. Then every Muslim must concur, Muhammad is the messenger sent by Allah. Therefore we trust everything he said to us. Everything he said to us. Now what is everything that he said? What are we talking about? Al-Ghayb. Who told us about what's gonna happen in the future? Who told us about Jannah? Who told us about now? The details thereof. Who told us what happened before we came into existence? You get my point? So everything he said to us about things we don't know. We don't need to know about what's going on here. We see this physically, but Allah's Messenger told us what it really means. That's why it's called al haqqa Because things appear one way, but they're really somewhere else, right? 
that every Muslim must concur Muhammad is the sent by Allah. Therefore, we trust everything he said to us. We must obey his orders, respect the things he called. All sacred laws, no, he brought the laws full and complete, not one detail did he. All sacred laws must come from him, sallallahu alayhi. So then he brought, the first thing he said, trust everything he said to us. He brought the laws full and, full and complete. He brought all the laws, fulfilled, fulfilled his mission. He didn't leave nothing. There's, why is this important? There's no secrets. Nobody could come to you and say, yo, man, I got the mops. Come with me. I'm going to teach you the secret ibadah that nobody else knows. Okay? We got this different way that we can go about. And if you come on, brother, you get on quick. We take the mothership. <laughs> I'll give you a glow in the dark kufi. You'll never be dark in, in, in the dark again. But people fall victim to these cults. Why? Because they don't understand the simple principle. He brought the law full and complete. Not one detail did he delete. There's nothing hidden. Well, I missed out when you said the bina is the uh, the other. You said shirk. It's shirk of the second shahada, because yeah, you're making shirk with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You're you you're obeying and following someone other than the messenger of Allah, and you've only been told to follow the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in particular ways. First way is how to worship. See? So respect the thing. We, we must obey his orders. And respect the things he called haram. A lot of people think the word haram means that it's illegal. Haram doesn't mean illegal. What would you say about masjid haram? It's the illegal masjid? Sacred. sacred. You get my point? So certain things are sacred. Sacred means inviolable. You can't play with them. There's no joking about them. Sacrilege is what we find a lot in this society where people make jokes about everything. They'll talk about your mother. Where someone, you know, you can't talk about a person's mother, right? You have to die over that. So people say things are sacrilege. Think of the sacrilege. But sacred means that they have to be dealt with a certain way. Intercourse is sacred. It has to be dealt with a certain way. If it's not done within the, the auspices of marriage, then it's called zina. You get my point? An ultramarital affair. Does everybody follow me? Yeah. Certain things are sacred. People's wealth is sacred. Islam has come to preserve and protect, prioritize and always protect my deen, my mind, my wealth, my honor, my lineage, myself. So we have the maqasid al-Islam, maqasid al-Sharia. These particular things are sacred in Islam and the whole Sharia protects them. Those things are haram, right? Sacred. So we have to understand, he brought the laws full and complete, not one detail did he delete. All sacred laws must come from him. Why do I say sacred laws? Because we can build a, a, a stoplight over here. We can do these particular things in, in our in our custom and our laws, but we can't do any sacred laws. A subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la I'm sorry, I didn't see you until last minute. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. We'll stop five minutes after the salah and we'll we, we just end it up, okay?